Well, good morning, everybody. I think we're about ready to get started. Uh, so we're, we're very blessed to have Jimmy Mitchell here. And uh, yeah, I just want to read, I'm going to read this little excerpt uh, from this book, Let Beauty Speak, uh, about him. Believing deeply in the power of beauty to evangelize culture, Jimmy Mitchell's gifts of storytelling and piano playing have brought him to every corner of the world. On top of, of being the founder of Love Good, he's the director of campus ministry at Jesuit High School in Tampa, Florida, which has repeatedly made national news for its growing culture of conversion. Whether he's mentoring young people in virtue or interviewing award-winning artists in his studio, Jimmy loves nothing more than helping others fall in love with God. And so uh, I think we have some good talks here today. And so without any further ado, let's uh, welcome Jimmy Mitchell. Thank you so much, Father. And thanks to all of you for coming out on a Saturday morning. It's a huge privilege for me to be with you. This is the last time I'm going to feel 42 degrees for a while because I do live in Tampa, Florida. I don't think it dropped this low but once in the last six months. And I know this is not even that low for you guys. It is just truly a joy to be with you, though. And I've spent the last couple of days uh, kind of all over the diocese. A good bit of time yesterday in Jackson and uh, been staying over at one of the hotels at Michigan State. Hopefully that's uh, okay with most of you guys, depending on where your allegiances lie. And had a wonderful time with some men this morning in Lansing before, before coming here to St. Gerard's. And again, uh, it's a joy, you know. I, I work at this very intense all-boys school down in Tampa and, you know, teaching even 20 of them once a day uh, and keeping them awake is no small feat. Uh, I can already tell this is a much friendlier crowd than the guys that I work with on a daily basis, and I'm really happy about that. Uh, before we dive in, let's just open in a prayer and give all of this over to the Lord and ask especially for the intercession of Our Lady. Uh, every day, every Saturday, is in fact a memorial of the Blessed Virgin Mary, and so we'll consecrate this time that we have together to her Immaculate Heart. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Father God, we thank you for the gift of life, for the breath in our lungs, and this opportunity to come together as a parish family this morning, to be reminded of the beauty of your love, a beauty that we see in creation, a beauty that we see in one another, a beauty that we see in the church, particularly through the sacraments. We ask in a particular way, Lord, that you would send your spirit upon us this morning to open our hearts and our minds to all the graces that you want to communicate to us maximize our receptivity to your love. And bless the Virgin Mary on this Saturday, like all Saturdays, very much uh, dedicated to you. We ask for your prayers. We ask for your protection. Keep us safe from every attack by the enemy. And in intercede for us in powerful ways, as we say. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let beauty speak. Before we really dive into what that means or what that could look like for our lives, I'd like to just tell you a little bit more about myself. I grew up in Atlanta, Georgia. You can see here a picture of me with my older brother. Uh, he's just pinched me, I'm assuming. Uh, whenever I show this picture to young people and I say, you know, guess which one's me, uh, they always pick the crybaby, I guess because I still kind of am one, I'm not sure. Uh, mom and dad were high school sweethearts, they had a, 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 a third child about four years after this picture was taken, and that's my beautiful little sister who's married with four kids and a fifth on the way, so she's real Catholic, and I just love her, I love her to death. She just moved from Bend, Oregon to Sarasota, Florida, so for the first time in 20 years, my whole family is now within an hour drive of each other. Really, really amazing. But we grew up in Atlanta. I played football with a guy by the name of Sean McVay. Some of you have heard of him. We won a state championship my senior year. He went on to become the head coach of the LA Rams and won his first Super Bowl only a couple years ago. You never know who you're going to meet as a kid and who you're going to be friends with that might actually become something later in life. But while sports kind of defined my childhood, Music, in a way, defined my young adulthood. I spent a lot of time in Nashville. 
It was very much the music industry that brought me there. I went to college there. I fell in love with the city and ended up becoming a seminarian at one point for the Diocese of Nashville. This is actually me with three of my closest friends at seminary. The tallest one is Father Peter Wigton, a pastor in Charlevoix, Michigan, from the Diocese of Gaylord. Do you know him by chance? He's a really dear friend of mine, so next time you see Father Peter, tell him that you met Jimmy Mitchell. Uh, he's down in Florida, actually, about twice a year, so we still get together all these years later. But I will say that so much of my life after seminary became a pretty wild apostolic adventure. Before I knew it, I was traveling the country, putting on uh, youth conferences, retreats, summer camps, and loving every minute of it. In fact, just recently, I bumped into a kid who's now 21, junior in college, who happened to be sitting five seats away from me at an NFL football game, and he walks by and he says, Jimmy? Jimmy Mitchell? And I recognized his face, but I definitely did not know his name. And we had met seven years prior at a Catholic summer camp in the North Georgia mountains. And next thing I know, he's like, right next to me, you know, taking the seat uh, as it emptied out at one point at halftime, uh, just to tell me about how that week of camp all those years prior had just totally changed his life. And there he was in college living his faith and being a, a real witness even to his family, who he was there with that day celebrating his 21st birthday. So you never really know where the Lord's going to lead you when you just say yes to him. And it led me eventually all over the world. But obviously the pandemic shut all that down. And before I knew it, in 2020, I was moving to Tampa, Florida. After 16 years of living in Nashville, I moved to beautiful, sunny Florida, thinking it was going to be something of a 10-month working sabbatical. Yeah, I'll come work for this all-boys school for a little while, but then I'm getting back to Music City, USA. I loved Nashville. At one point, I ran for city council in Nashville. I dreamed of being the mayor of Nashville. I mean, that's how ridiculous I am, you know? Uh, but I found that in Tampa, there was not only a home, but a mission, a mission that led me to uh, now stay for the last four years as director of campus ministry at this amazing school. Here you see a group of young men just casually praying a walking rosary at the end of the school day. It's the most normal thing at this very intense all-boys school, mostly known for its sports, to see young men in very casual but in very visible ways practicing their faith. In fact, this school year alone, we have 19 students becoming Catholic. Last year, we had 15. The year before that, 20. My first year there, 22. That's over 75 students in four school years opting into our RCIA program to become Catholic. And it's in part the retreats. It's in part the theology teachers that are so amazing. It's also this epic chapel that we built a few years ago where, you know, all 860 of us can gather every single day. This is several of them at the RCIA mass last school year. But imagine a $10 million basilica, practically, right there in the middle of campus, making it clear all day, every day, that Christ is King. I have a student that recently came into my office and said, Mr. Mitchell, it was just the beauty of the chapel on day one of my freshman year that made me realize I'm not living my life right. Just the beauty that spoke to him at the first all-school mass was the very thing that got him to become Catholic. He joined RCAA a few months later. What does that look like, not just through art and architecture, but even through our lives, to let beauty speak, to bring about a deepening of our own conversion and to inspire conversion in others? That's how I want to uh, spend this morning. We'll come back in the afternoon and get even more practical with this. But for now, I just want to begin with a very simple thought that beauty really does matter. And I'll begin that thought by telling a story. About 10 years ago, I was on a plane from Nashville to LA, and eventually from LA to Tahiti, and then eventually from there, Auckland, New Zealand. And this was a picture that I took looking outside the window as I was eating dinner, flying from Nashville to LA. So imagine moving from the East Coast to the West Coast at sunset. Would have been the longest sunset I've ever seen in my life because we were chasing it. It's an unbelievable encounter with beauty. At the beginning of a trip, that was a little daunting. I had never traveled to the other side of the world, and certainly not by myself. And so I was really edified, consoled, when not only I'm looking at this incredible sunset at one point, but only a few rows in front of me is a Nashville Dominican sister. 
I know you guys have Ann Arbor Dominican sisters up here, but down in Nashville where I lived at the time, I had become very friendly with many of these sisters. And one of them was on her way to Sydney where she was on mission as a teacher at a Catholic school over there. So I ended up striking up this whole conversation with her and feeling at home even as I was moving farther and farther away from home. And eventually I was picked up in Auckland, New Zealand by a farmer whose name was Sam. And we woke up the next morning and this was the view out his back door. Just unbelievable. This is like an iPhone 6. This is not even a high quality photograph. But I felt like it was on set of The Lord of the Rings or one of the Hobbit movies, which, oh, by the way, is exactly where they filmed these movies. New Zealand is pretty much where all of those live action films were, were recorded. And so I, I wasn't terribly surprised when the next day uh, a seminarian picked me up and actually took me to Hobbiton, where they filmed the movies. And I climbed into one of those hobbit holes at, you know, five, eight and a half, feeling like everything was, for the first time in my life, perfectly proportioned for a guy my size, all right? It was unbelievable. And then you get to the end of this tour and this, this pub that they perfectly preserved from the, the movies called The Prancing Pony. And I just, again, amazingly felt at home, even though I was thousands and thousands of miles away from Nashville. And not only did I feel at home, but again, I felt a profound sense of mission. I learned pretty quickly that these kids over there on the other side of the world are not that different from, uh, you know, Americans. Uh, that they love to have fun. That they want to get into, you know, uh, a, a mud war or messy games, as most summer camps tend to, uh, you know, devolve or, or lead into by the end of the week. But also, we had mass every day. We had adoration and confession. I saw young people coming alive in their faith in a way that I had never really thought possible. And then on the, the last trip that I made to New Zealand, which was a few years ago, a bunch of them wanted to take me out uh, to the botanical gardens in Wellington, which is the southernmost city on the North Island. They wanted to show me some live music. You know, coming from Nashville, where we have 200 live shows a night, they wanted to show me something of their own local culture. And the music was great. We had a good time at this festival. But next thing I know, they're saying, you know, Jimmy, we're not that far away from where you might finally be able to see glowworms. And I had been hearing about glowworms for years, ever since my first trip to New Zealand. Now, as a, as a southerner, you know, and a, a, a guy from the American South, when they said glowworms, I was picturing something akin to lightning bugs. That, that was as far as my imagination could go. And I said, yeah great, let's abandon the live music and walk down these, you know, very darkly lit trails into the woods and see what we can find. That's just a great idea, my last night in New Zealand. They convinced me. We turned off our phones. They, t they told me I had to be absolutely silent, that the only way the glow omens would come out is if, you know, they felt safe, if there was no lights and if there was no noise. And sure enough, we're 20 minutes into this walk down this darkly lit path. And I'm beginning to think, oh, this is some kind of joke. They're about to walk me off of the path over a cliff into a lake or something, you know? But eventually, this young woman, she, she turns to me, and she says, Psh, Jimmy, come here. And I, I kind of follow the, the sound of her voice, and next thing I know, she's telling me to look down at this, this patch of dirt. She said, just focus your eyes. You won't be able to see anything right away, but focus your eyes on this patch of dirt and wait for about 30 seconds. And so I'm counting down from 30, thinking this is still just one big joke. And eventually, one by one, I started to see these piercing bright lights coming out of the dirt that looked something like this. Really unlike anything I'd ever seen in my entire life. At that point, I had traveled to a lot of different parts of the world. I had never seen glowworms. And I felt a lot less like I was looking down at a patch of dirt and much more like I was looking up at the sky, at a constellation of stars. An experience that I'm sure many of us have had, especially if we live outside of a big city. There's something about the beauty of God's creation that at once pulls us out of ourselves, even as it makes us feel very much at home. And this has been a consistent experience of my entire life, that beauty, in fact, is always and everywhere an encounter with Christ, perhaps even a foretaste of heaven. In the book of wisdom, we read this. 
If through delight in the beauty of these things, men assume them to be gods, let them know how much better than these is their Lord, for the author of beauty created them. And if men were amazed at their power in working, let them perceive from them how much more powerful is he who formed them. For from the greatness and beauty of created things comes a corresponding perception of their creator. I love that last line. For from the greatness and beauty of created things comes a corresponding perception of their creator. How many times in our own lives have we encountered Christ through beauty without even realizing it was happening? How often do we pause in those encounters to lift up a prayer of thanksgiving? How many of our family members and friends who don't even practice the faith might be encountering God through beauty on a near daily basis and just need somebody to help them connect the dots? To connect the dots between the creator and his creation, between the beauty that they are perceiving and the author of beauty from which it came. With all that in mind, I invite you to to contemplate this beautiful quote from a 14th century Byzantine theologian. Maybe to call to mind some of your own encounters with beauty up until this point in your life. And in a moment, I'm going to step over to the piano and play uh, a song, an original song that um, it's almost like part of a film score for a movie that doesn't exist, okay? And the song is called Wonder. But this quote, I think, is very, very powerful. When men have a longing so great that it surpasses human nature, and they eagerly desire and are able to accomplish things beyond human thought, it is the bridegroom, Christ himself, who has smitten them with this longing. It is Christ who has sent a ray of his beauty into their eyes. The greatness of the wound already shows the arrow which has struck home. The longing indicates who has inflicted the wound. That when we encounter God with beauty, we are filled with a longing. There is a wound there. And if we're able to understand what's happening, we're, we'll trace that wound, we'll trace that arrow, better yet, back to its source. God himself, again, the author of all that is true and good and beautiful. So for just a moment, we can lift up our own prayer of thanksgiving. As I play this song on the piano, a prayer of thanksgiving for all those moments in your life where God has revealed himself through beauty. Maybe there's been moments that you haven't even pondered or put language around until now or thanked God for until now. I mean, the sun's out today. That's kind of amazing after the last 48 hours, isn't it? And it feels to me how Georgia used to feel growing up in October, you know, like that crispness in the air, in the blue skies. That for me was a simple but wonderful encounter with beauty this morning to just step out into the fresh air. What a gift. You know, my, my family, as I mentioned, is now all very close within an hour drive of each other. So last weekend, I got to spend time with my four nieces and nephews. It was such a joy just to mess around, to play, to wrestle, and to be with them. That was an encounter with beauty for me. That was a moment where time kind of stopped. I couldn't put into words the joy that I was feeling, but the joy was real. So maybe it has been some encounter with God's creation. Maybe it's been uh, family and friends. Maybe it's been uh, music, art, architecture. But my hunch is that all of us have encountered God through beauty many, many times throughout our lives, perhaps many, many times, even just in the last week. And again, this is an opportunity to call those memories and moments to mind, to give God thanks for them, and to ponder this, this ray of beauty that has struck you and that has reminded you that you are not alone in this world and that God is always, always reminding us of our heavenly homeland. Again, this song is called Wonder.
So these moments where I'll sit down at the piano, which will happen a few more times throughout the day, I do believe are just opportunities for us to speak to God as a friend, to call to mind memories, to thank him, maybe even to seek healing as the morning unfolds, because there'll be other things that come up, even difficult things. But this longing that we all have, what C.S. Lewis calls an infinite desire, is surely one of the greatest defenses for the existence of God. I mean, we could get into Thomas Aquinas' five proofs for the existence of God. We could get into St. Anselm's ontological argument for the existence of God. But I think most of us could really get behind this idea of beauty, being a signpost to an author of beauty, a creator of all. Maybe you have family and friends who are very far from the faith. They have no interest in God. They certainly don't want to hear what the Catholic Church has to say about anything. And let's face it, the church has lost all the moral high ground just in the last 20, 30 years. But no one is an enemy of beauty. At least in my experience, it's one of the best entry points for one, our own deepening of conversion, but two, the evangelization of family and friends. And that's in large part because we are living in a post-Christian culture. Now, this is a phrase that even Wikipedia has a pretty decent definition of. What is post-Christianity according to Wikipedia? The situation in which Christianity is no longer the dominant civil religion of society, but it's gradually assumed values, culture, and worldviews that aren't Christian. Post-Christianity tends to refer to the loss of Christianity's influence in historically Christian societies. And they've lost that influence to atheism or secularism in most cases. When I brought up this phrase, you know, of a post-Christian culture with many of my students who were seniors at the high school that I worked for, they began to describe a post-Christian culture with the following words. There's no sense of the transcendent. There's no sense of meaning or purpose to life. They described a normalization of sin, relativism, which is to say everybody has their own truth. They talked about the breakdown of the family, the loss of faith, no sense of community, materialism, a denial of reality, <laughs> a love of comfort, a misguided pursuit of happiness, a hatred of tradition, and even a loss of hope. I mean, these are 17-year-old boys most of which have not been raised actually by families who practice the faith at all. For most of them, they've had a deepening of conversion since being at the high school. And even they are able to assess our post-Christian culture with this kind of language. Robert Cardinal Seurat, one of my favorite cardinals in the church right now, he put it like this, the tragedy of our world is never better summed up than in the fury of senseless noise that stubbornly hates silence. This age detests the things that silence brings us to, encounter, wonder, and kneeling before God. To break it down, and not to blame it all on our smartphones, most of us spend seven to nine hours a day behind a screen. That's the latest stat. Seven to nine hours a day where we're not tuned into reality, we're not beholding God and the beauty of his creation, we're not even beholding God and making eye contact with other human beings. Seven to nine hours a day, the average American is behind their screen. And when it comes to their phone, there's an average of over 100 pickups a day, which is to say 100 interruptions, 100 distractions. It's almost impossible to have wonder silence and kneeling before God in a culture that is that full of noise. It's because our hearts are full of noise. So even now, what, what does it look like to commit just 15 minutes of our day to silence, to begin somewhere really concrete? Maybe some of us have access to daily mass. Well, how might we stay for a few minutes afterwards or show up a few minutes beforehand to just dwell in the silence of God's love for us? This Blessed Sacrament Chapel is a perfect place to enter into that silence, to push back on the noise in our own souls. But it's not just the noise that defines our post-Christian culture. It's the normalization of sin. Abortion has taken 62 million lives legally since 1973. I mean, thanks be to God for the overturning of Roe v. Wade. But we have 18% of a generation that is not with us, that never made it out of the womb because of abortion. Porn, right now, is a $97 billion global industry. 
porn sites receive more average traffic than Netflix, Amazon, and Twitter combined. And the average age of first exposure is now as low as nine or 10 years of age. It's a plague on our society. And a lot of this is, in fact, caused by the total lack of faith, the lack of religion in our society. In fact, those who claim to be religiously unaffiliated is six percentage points higher right now than it was five years ago, and 10 points higher than it was a decade ago. Currently, 29% of us in America claim to be an atheist, an agnostic, or nothing in particular. And with that comes a loneliness, an isolation. We're disconnected from God. We're disconnected, therefore, from a parish or a faith community. We're even disconnected from our own families. You know, we have the third highest divorce rate in the world. I mean, that's a roll of the die to get married in today's American culture. You got a 50-50 chance of making it. That's a crazy, crazy statistic that most of us now just take for granted. Anxiety, depression, and suicide, suicide rates have all been on the rise since 2010, which coincidentally is the same year that all smartphones uh, developed the front-facing camera. See, smartphones came out in 2007, but the front-facing camera, I believe, has led to the demise, at least of the mental health, of so many of our young people. Because a camera that's always looking at you teaches you to always look at yourself as well. And that's a recipe for misery, isn't it? One of my best spiritual directors in college said that you really, Jimmy, should think about yourself for two minutes a day. Only think about yourself for two minutes a day. And let that be your examination of conscience at the end of the day. To put it differently, to borrow C.S. Lewis's definition of humility, he said it's not to think less of yourself, but to think about yourself less. See, that's the source of all joy, to get our minds off of ourselves, to stop navel-gazing. But again, our society teaches us to be narcissists. And the final stat, just to further depress you, Right now, 33% of American children are not even living or growing up in homes with their biological fathers. Pope Benedict XVI sums all of this up with a phrase that he called the dictatorship of relativism, which is to say that we have lost all sense of the true. We have no respect for objective reality anymore. And you see, the problem with that is if we reject objective truth, we eventually reject Christ himself, who is the way, the truth, in the life. And again, in a culture that has sidelined truth with relativism, we've even sidelined goodness with cynicism. Perhaps beauty is the last standing transcendental. Perhaps beauty is the entry point into the hearts of this particular generation, this particular era that we're living through. But you know, call it noise, call it relativism. Call it what you want, it really all boils down to sin. We're living, obviously, on a battlefield every day that we wake up. The enemy of our souls wants nothing more than to lie, steal, and destroy. Stay sober and alert, St. Peter once wrote. Your opponent, the devil, is prowling like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Resist him, solid in your faith. I'm going to play another song. This one's called The Battle. It's an opportunity to pause and reflect on those areas of our own life, in our own heart, where we have succumbed to this post-Christian culture. Maybe to recognize that, yeah, I do spend way too much time on my phone and not enough time on my knees. I do get swept up with some of this cynicism and skepticism, maybe even relativism, all the isms, you know. We just came through the season of Lent, but what still in our hearts remains to be repented of where do we still need Christ on the throne? You know, working again at this all boys school every day, I see this beautiful church and I walk past it 18 times a day. And we start every school day inside that church and it's a constant reminder that Christ is king, king of the universe, but he's also meant to be king of my heart. So what are those areas in our own hearts this morning where we are more on the throne than he is? What things can we begin to surrender back to him lest they become idols walking in i was so inspired to see long lines for confession that's the surest sign of a healthy parish 
that we are continually coming back to the Lord's mercy again and again. But the reality is, the battle is at hand. And all of us can recognize the joys and the struggles of living the Christian faith in today's world. So I invite you to ponder some of those struggles in your own life, what we're up against, as I again play this song that's called The Battle. I wrote that song many years ago for my brother who had this crazy dream that led to a real conversion in his life when he was in his 20s. And in that dream, he did describe this battle that was raging. And because that battle felt so hopeless in the dream, he woke up feeling a bit desperate. And it was then that he called me and recognized slowly over a 45 minute conversation the beauty of God's mercy and this incredible opportunity he had to come back to the sacraments. And within an hour of that phone call, he was at a church in confession. He walked in looking like he was holding the weight of the world on his shoulders. He walked out looking like he was floating three inches off the ground. See, beauty can take so many different forms. I don't think it takes any more powerful form, at least this side of heaven, than in the sacramental life of the church. Pope St. John Paul II, he puts it this way, the world in which we live needs beauty in order not to sink into despair. Beauty, like truth, brings joy to the human heart. I could describe the beauty of Eucharistic adoration for the first time when I was 14, year old, 14 years old, kneeling on a concrete floor in the North Georgia mountains, realizing for the first time that God was God and I wasn't. That began a relationship of love that's been unfolding ever since. It wasn't long after that that I went to college. I experienced the beauty of faith at this massive conference where there were Christians from all over the world gathered to sing praise to the Lord. You can tell this isn't a Catholic conference, but believe it or not, it was this conference that gave me a desire for the sacraments like never before. And next thing I knew, I was living abroad, studying in London, and falling in love with the church and began going to daily mass. So there's very obvious ways in which God communicates beauty through the church, 
to the faith of others, but I do believe that he's communicating beauty at all times if we have the eyes to see it. Pope Francis says that every expression of true beauty can thus be acknowledged as a path leading to an encounter with the Lord Jesus. Perhaps more important or more powerful than art, and architecture, and music is how we choose to live our lives, the way that beauty can in fact bring people to the Lord in the way that we live. Pope Benedict really hones in on this when he says, to me, art and the saints are the greatest apologetics for our faith. The beauty that we see in art, great. But even more, the beauty that we have in holiness, the holiness of the saints. This past winter, I got to visit the tombs of several of my favorite saints in northern Italy. And while I was in Milan taking a picture in front of Il Duomo, which happens to be the church on the front cover of my new book, because I hadn't actually seen it before, I bumped into a few students, not even kidding, who were also on a bit of a holiday with their family, thousands of miles away from Tampa, Florida. Very Italian family. The one on the left is Nino. Next to him is Nico. Their dad's name is Tino. Their last name is Provenzano. You get it, all right? And then me and my buddy Reed are just looking very Irish and sunburned because I live in Florida and he lives in Rome. Well, we got to visit Pier Giorgio Frassati, one of my favorite young blitzes. He died at the age of 24. I got to the end of reading a biography of his several years ago and just found myself weeping. I mean, do I look like a crier to you? I, I guess I do based on that baby picture that I showed. But it's very rare for me to cry while reading a book. But it was something about the holiness of this young man who very suddenly died of polio at the age of 24, but who lived with such heroic virtue that thousands of people showed up at his funeral, many of whom his family had never met, had no clue about, because so many of them were in fact the poor, the homeless, that he would get up in the middle of the night to serve there in the streets of Turin. Well, from there we got to visit this beautiful basilica of Mary Help of Christians, where St. John Bosco is buried, where St. Dominic Savio is buried, where many of my favorite Salesian saints are buried. And there's very few people who have inspired me more over the course of my lifetime, but especially my adulthood, than St. John Bosco. He was a father to countless orphan boys in the height of the Industrial Revolution. His love for the Lord, his commitment to prayer, and his fatherhood of young men has shaped my entire life mission up until this point. So to get to pray at his tomb, really on the eve of the new year, this was New Year's Eve at midnight, adoration and benediction was unfolding with Don Bosco to my right and Dominic Savio to my left. And I thought there's just no better way to kick off a new year. And that desire for holiness, I hope that it's welling up in your own heart this morning. Bishop Barron puts it this way. Each of the saints, in his or her own utterly unique manner, show forth some aspect of God's beauty and perfection. You see, God makes saints the way he makes plants and animals and stars, exuberantly, effervescently, and with a preference for wild diversity. Behind that quote, you see the tomb of St. Augustine, where I also got to spend some time in prayer. And next to him, the image on the right, is Ambrose, the man who baptized Augustine all those centuries ago. And if you zoom in closely on Ambrose, you'll notice that he is flanked by two deacon martyrs. To think, yeah, that's right. Nobody storms heaven alone. That all of us, especially as a church, are on pilgrimage with Christ to the Father. We're on pilgrimage to heaven. It's okay that things feel a little bit messy along the way. This life is, in fact, just a temporary, brief blip on the radar screen of eternity. So all that really matters in the end is that we become saints. Leon Bloy, a great French poet, put it this way. He said, the only real tragedy in life is to not become a saint. I'm convinced that it's the beauty of holiness found in the saints that have shaped every era and really given rise to every great renewal in history over these last 2,000 years. 
You think about these friends who were all living at the same time in Turin, Italy, or Milan. You go around the city of Rome, if you've ever been on pilgrimage there, and you have left and right saints and apostles buried in churches. Why couldn't there be a similar coming together of aspiring saints in our country, perhaps even very specifically here in Lansing? Why else would the Lord call us together on a Saturday morning except to remind us of the beauty of his love and the beauty of our call to pass that love on to everybody that we encounter, to be those saints that our world so desperately needs us to be? When we come back in about 30 minutes, we're going to dive into how beauty, in fact, makes saints out of us, how beauty even inspires others in their own faith, in their own conversion. We're going to get really practical looking at some of the principles in my book, the first one being freedom, the second one being friendship, the third being suffering, and the fourth being mission. For the next 30 minutes, we have an opportunity to get to know each other a little bit, to enjoy some snacks and drinks in the social hall. I've also got copies of my book over there that you can purchase. And I'm just very, very eager to hear something of, of your story, to hear about the role that beauty has played in your own life and how God is calling you in your own way to be a saint. And again, we'll get really practical and really personal with that when we come back. We just want to be back in here for the next talk at 1145. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. All of our patron saints and guardian angels, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. For those who don't know St. Gerard's, which is probably very few of you, the social hall is just beyond the narthex, over in that general direction. So to your left, my right. We'll see you in there.